start with four. Welcome. I am Lori Little, Director of Communications for the Oregon Restaurant Lodging Association. Thanks for participating in today's webinar, The Edge of Computing, How Behavioral Nudges, Smart Alerts, and Pattern Recognition Will Change Your Operation Forever. This webinar is presented by BYOD, a company that was conceived, architect, and developed by restaurant operators for restaurant operators. More about them in just a minute. Uh, we do invite your comments and questions during the webinar. Please use the chat feature to type in your questions and the presenters will respond uh, when they get a, a chance to do so. Please note this webinar is being recorded. A link to the recording and presentation slides will be available. Uh, we're actually going to email those to all registrants following the webinar. So now to introduce our presenters. Sam Short is a lifelong restaurateur who specializes in team building and development, operational systems integration, and conceptualization and implementation of business strategy. That's a mouthful. Over the last 20 years, Sam has been able to help develop more than 30 brands in the restaurant, bar, and brewery world through the early adoption of new technology. For over 20 years, Dave Graham has collaborated with big box retailers like Walmart, Meyer, Menard, Lowe's, and Home Depot on their national branding strategy and live goods packaging and signage. He's currently a, an operations manager at Downtown Restaurant Investment Properties with responsibilities in five different brands, including casual, fine dining, and barbecue. So, with that, please welcome Sam and Dave. You guys may take it over. Awesome. Lori, thank you so much for the introduction. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Sam. I'm uh, currently our Chief Strategy Officer at uh, BYOD. Um, uh, again, like Lori mentioned, I'm also an operator. I own a restaurant business with a couple different concepts in the Lansing and East Lansing area of Michigan um, and have been uh, in the industry for the last um, 25 years. Um, so I, I'll let Dave jump in real quick and then I'll, I'll get into kind of how we started with BYOD. Hi, I'm Dave Graham. I'm the brand manager of BYOD. And as Lori said, I'm also an operations manager for Downtown Restaurant Investments, which is a company that is owned by Dave Dittenberg, our co-founder, uh, which involves us actually owning and or managing various restaurant properties in the Midland, Michigan area. So I too am uh, operationally uh, involved in the in the hospitality business. Perfect. Thanks, guys, and thanks everyone for uh, taking the time to to um, uh, listen to us talk about this. We get uh, obviously really geeky and uh, interested in uh, how we can push forward uh, technology and its engagement with uh, with where it intersects with the restaurant business. Um, I've been kind of an early adopter of many technologies. I mean, whether it's cloud based POSs or or, um, or online ordering at my locations for many years and uh, sat on the board of the Michigan Restaurant and Lodging Association uh, with Dave Dittenberg, how we actually first met probably eight years ago. Um, and we were both um, in uh, um, a scenario, we were at a winter board meeting and we were both uh, complaining about all of our uh, kind of IOT, all the disparate things that we had in the restaurant. And I'm saying, well, I've got these, these 15 things that don't talk to each other. And my POS doesn't talk to my event calendar. And my event calendar isn't scheduling this and you know, um, all of these different pieces. And, um, and, and just you know, preaching to the choir sort of a, a little bit. Dave at the time um, had a good friend who was the CIO of Dow Chemical, um, a, guy, a guy named uh, Frank Buchik. Frank is now our CTO and, uh, and co-founder and the chief architect um, here at BYOD and had been talking to him about just that issue and how things can engage, what the, how you can start to use programs to get real data sources from them, how you can start to um, use data to then solve things 
and uh, all these programs that say we have insights and we have all this stuff where the where the real issue is and how to get to the core of, of the solution and so um we were complaining i was i was using a, an erp uh on the back end and um to get insights into my cost of goods data and my cost of labor data and some of these other pieces and spending you know it was 35 grand up front or whatever it was at the time and then we were spending um, a couple thousand bucks uh, a quarter uh, on the software itself. And then we had to hire somebody um, full time in our accounting department just to run the software to make sure it was integrating with everything it was supposed to, which never really happened. And so in the end, uh, I ended up having our director of accounting uh, do an analysis. I'm like, I just want to figure out between labor and my cost in this, the time, all these different pieces, what am I actually spending on this? And via these insights, what am I actually saving? Um, and it turns out that we were literally spending and saving about the same amount. We were, we were a, a zero sum game, which is really not what you want to be um, in these scenarios. And Dave had the same, the same uh, uh, thing. So that's, that's kind of the inspiration of where this came from. You know, the next step for us was, okay, if you have these issues and you have these things, how do we make it easier for operators, right? How do we make it so that you're not sitting like, like these poor guys with seven different iPads up and tablets and these things um, and multiple programs running to try and eke out the, you know, that last drop. Um, and what do we need to do to get there? And this is where Dave and Frank's conversation sort of came in and, and, and Frank said, well, you need automation, right? In manufacturing, you had automation that went from, um, in, you know, in the, in, in the forties and fifties, you're looking at, um, almost one in three jobs in the, in, 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 are in manufacturing in the United States by the time you get. Um, to the 1980s and 90s, that's up to one in eight, right? And how does that happen? How does that change get affected? It get, gets affected by looking at processes individually and then figuring out how to connect those to thoughts and data and insight. And then more importantly, figuring out how to get those insights then automated, right? So it's not just about, hey, I can tell you what you're doing wrong. It's I can tell you what you're doing wrong and give you the plan on what you need to do it right. And that's the big gap that we see in the restaurant industry. There's lots of people that are telling you what, you know, oh, you're doing this wrong, or this is an issue, you have an issue with cost of labor and cost of goods and these different things. There really aren't that many people who are then saying, and here is the exact game plan that you need. Um, and the reason is because it's difficult. It's difficult to correlate all of those different things. You look at, you know, Carly uh, Fiorina, the old Kilo Packers uh, CEO said, you know, the goal is to turn data in, into information, information, and insight. I would take it one step further and then turn that insight into an action plan, right? And that's the core of what we talked about internally at BYOD was um, how can we do that? And what we came to the realization uh, uh, about is you can only do it a couple different ways. You can only do it if you have good data coming from good sources and that, and you have uh, a, a data set of data sources that covers the entirety of the restaurant. So frankly, that's not just we connect to a point of sale. It's not just we connect to your scheduling app, home base or hot schedules or these different things. And it's not just those pieces. It's um, you have to connect to cameras you have to have a real view of what's going on. And then most importantly, you have to do it at speed in real time. And this is where it gets difficult for most people. Right now, most IoT, so internet of things, that's your point of sale system, that's your camera system, that's your pagers, that's your buzzers, that's all these different things. Most of those things filter directly up to a cloud, typically a cloud that they own with dashboards and different things engaged in that cloud. Think of the cloud as like a really big warehouse, right? It just stores a bunch of stuff. And there are different ways that it can store. You can do data lake, data warehouse, data storage. There's all these different processes, but it's just a big, big warehouse that stores all your information and data sets. It doesn't necessarily sort it well, right? That's what those programs do. Um, and it doesn't give you, um, the programs on the front end will give you those insights. 
The problem is it's really expensive to house all these things, whether in server cost or these other things. And it's really expensive for your programs to search through them. And so there's a new concept called edge computing. What edge computing is, is computational algorithms, artificial intelligence, machine learning, deep learning, whatever those things are that live in the layer right between your internet of things and your cloud, the data warehouse. So think of it as a person standing in the doorway of the warehouse, right? It's gonna take them a long time to run down the aisle and get all the information they need. And it's expensive to go and do those things. But if you can filter that information as it comes in through the door within a set of parameters, it means that you can get those actionable items at a much faster and less expensive rate. And that's where you go from AIs that make a lot of sense to implement for 5 million bucks in a warehouse that does $500 million annually to an AI that's cost effective to implement in a $2 million a year restaurant, right? Is when you can get in front of those things, save those costs and save those pieces. The next step for us in deciding on AI, actually go back one day, boy. Um, the next step for us in deciding on AI, uh, our AI living in an edge computing geography is how you build that AI so it makes sense. And that's where event-driven architecture comes in, right? So setting up those parameters, setting up the, the, the specs, so to say, on what information the AI needs to be able to pull out as it goes through that doorway into the warehouse and what it needs to put back, what's a flag for it. And by, by designing an AI that lives uh, in that edge computing structure based on an event-driven architecture, you can start to develop an AI that's, that, that really can not just pull data sets, but learn which data sets it should pull, right? So as it pulls these things in, it can get to the point where it says, okay, here's where you, here's the spectrum you told me to look at. But realistically, this is not the right spectrum to look at. You need to, to be more effective, look at this spectrum, look at these issues, look at these things. And it can only do that if it lives on that front edge. So that's, that was our first step in kind of changing the dynamic um, that we saw in a lot of companies, which was most people store everything in the data warehouse, right? In, in the cloud, um, pull a couple of data pieces out that a human has decided are, oh, this is what we should look at, right? Not necessarily we've gotten the data and then from the data push toward an insight, a human has said, this is a KPI rather than getting a bunch of calculations and data and letting that data lead them to what a KPI is, right? And not doing it in real time, maybe you do it once a day, maybe you do it once a week, maybe you do it on your monthly P&L. But what we realized is if we can get to things in real time at the doorway, we can also get to solutions in real time, right? So right now we were seeing a lot of dashboards that you ingest, you get an insight, and then you have to have a meeting with your ops team and you have to sit down and say, okay, hey, cost of goods are off in three of these seven regional stores. And we need to, and we think it's because of this and whatever in our provider, and here's our plan. And then we have to go out and finish the plan. Then we have to go out and implement. And, you know, if you're really lucky, it's a week process. And if you're less lucky, it's a couple week process. And during that time period, you might be off two, three points on cost of goods, and it might be several thousand bucks in loss. And while on an individual level, that one issue was not a huge one and it got solved, we all know this is the restaurant industry, right? You got one of those a week, 52 weeks a year, and those costs build up, right? And especially because implementing those strategies takes so much time. So we said, all right, if we can live in, uh, in that edge and we can, we can get the information we need in real time, can we also push that back out? So Dave jumped to the next one, if you don't mind. And th this is where we started thinking about how does that work, right? 
So if we're going to do that, what do we need? So uh, uh, Ginny Rometty, right? There is no AI with, without IA, and that that's there's no artificial intelligence without um, intelligent architecture. And that's that event-based architecture piece. And so we said, okay, if we're going to do that and start taking these insights and then pushing them out to people, we have to be able to do it in a format that they can understand, and we have to be able to do it um, in a way that they'll adopt and ingest, right? Um, and that's one of the things we've realized in our in our beta testing is that uh, it doesn't matter how good your AI is or your machine learning algorithm or any of these other pieces, because they're not the people that are implementing the change. It's the line cooks, your bartenders, right? Your managers, your assistant managers. These are the people who are engaging on a daily basis, who are using the insights and using these operate operational changes. And so to do that, you have to get them to adopt, right? You have to get them uh, to a point where they're uh, familiar and comfortable with it. So to do that, you build out tools and you give them things they can use, you engage them. And Dave will talk about a little bit about behavioral nudges and gamification, some other pieces. Um, but what we started doing was saying, okay, uh, we have to digitize. There are lots and lots of people out there that maybe you have a digital POS and maybe you have a scheduling app, but you use paper checklists or a paper log or, you know, old red book style, um, or you, you know, are still using an Excel workbook for your scheduling. And there are lots of restaurants in our industry that really aren't fully digital. So the key for us was, let's get them completely digital. So we, we looked at building suites of tools and, and doing these other things to try to get people familiar with being digital in a world that for so long was on paper and still continues to be in many places. Um, and part of that is that employee training piece and part of that is then the execution. But our goal really is to get people comfortable with engaging with a digital process. And so that when we look at releasing, for example, our AI, is, her name is Mabel, she's awesome. Um, when we look at releasing Mabel, they're already familiar with the back and forth. They're okay, if they see an insight coming in or they see an alert, a smart alert coming in, they are already, already used to that process, right? And it's not completely alien to them. So uh, making sure that you're building out that, that information architecture, both in the digital world and in the operation world, is one of the keys we found to making sure those two worlds sync up. So Dave, will you jump to the next one? And so this is where Dave jumps in, right? And it's not just about that architecture, it's not just about the digital piece, right? And saying, hey, here's, here's what we wanna do. It's, it's about um, uh, engaging employees, the people who are gonna take an insight from Mabel, you know, or, or any AI, and affect the change, right? Mabel sends them something and says, hey, cut cook Javier L right now to save $26.53, right? Based on sales and historical data, and all these different things. Well, how does that get taken by a Javier, by the manager? How much time does it actually take to implement that? All these different pieces are important. And so we sort of, we took a, a step back and said, hey, it's not just about creating an AI, it's about creating an AI people don't hate. <laughs> um, and this is where this, these behavioral nudges and, and this gamification piece came in. And so with that, I'll let Dave talk uh, uh, here a little bit about um, rewards, training, nudges, all those different pieces and kind of what makes sense um, uh, to, to, so that people don't think AI and think, you know, how, right? They think AI and they think someone friendly who's actually supporting them, assisting them, um, someone who's a touchstone, someone who can engage with them in a positive way. Um, and because of that, listen to the AI. So we tried to make uh, the reward system and the gamification as uh, user-friendly to uh, the younger generations as possible. And uh, they live their lives digitally on their phones, on their iPads, on their computers, they're shopping, their uh, social media, they're dating, they're interacting uh, almost on a minute by minute basis uh, in a digital fashion. So what we tried to do is take the basic concept of completionism and gamification and adapt it to their duties within the restaurants. 
So here we're looking at screens that give them a, a second by second update on what they're completing in the form of checklists and tasks, but also it's setting the standardized goals and integrating communication between their manager, themselves, the rest of the staff, and all of this is happening in real time at the same time. So you can have several people completing tasks in the restaurant at a closing, an opening, or a midday checklist in front of house, in back of house. It's all overseen and set up ahead of time so that they're not burdened by running back and forth with a checklist and asking questions to and from the manager or looking for sign off or being chased around. They're very efficiently walking through their checklists on their duties. They're seeing their completion. It's completing a puzzle, like completing a game, like completing a level of something that they're doing digitally. And it's something they're very familiar and comfortable with already. This leads to the reward system of those employees who are playing the game best, completing the game best, being rewarded in the best shifts and it identifies your best employees without bias and also gives your managers an overview of what is happening with the fewer staff members that are available in today's job market. So the whole concept of completionism and gamification leads to rewards and can be used as part of your employee reward program, however you see fit. But it's completely designed around what they're comfortable with, what they're using, and in the digital format that they're, they're presently using every day for their entire life. So again, as Sam said, real time, it's in real time so that it's not frustrating. It's in a gamification mode, so it's something they're comfortable with, and it's not an AI that's, that's hard to understand. The setup for this generally is hours, not months. Uh, I think Sam referred to months or longer of setting up systems prior to this. And employee training is, is measured simply in an hour or two. Um, in our restaurants, we have employees, when they come on board, that basically throw, go through a quick onboarding. They choose whether or not they're going to use their device or a restaurant device. And the training is usually under half an hour and they're up and going for logbook, checklist, and to do and moving forward. So again, it's all preset, predetermined, and it's feeding the brain and getting the feedback from Mabel. The operational implementation means the augmentation and the phase one is observation. And you are using the cameras to observe what you're seeing or what the cameras are seeing are everything that the managers are not seeing or what you don't normally pick up on. Phase two is the pattern recognition and the reasoning and the artificial intelligence. So you're fusing the observations, drawing conclusions and making recommendations in the form of smart alerts delivered to the managers. So it really goes beyond just observing. It's observing whatever falls outside of the parameters that are set and those parameters are constantly updated gives an alert to whether it or not it's measuring up to or not measuring up to the observation and what the augmentation of the observation would be and immediately a manager is being sent a corrective action and then the third phase is speech processing and the interaction with this kind of artificial intelligence will take the form of uh, speech recognition in the form of you can simply speak to Mabel and Mabel will make recommendations or take action based upon your speech. So you've gone from actually entering information to seeing patterns visually from the cameras to speech processing and you've moved through the artificial intelligence, which is always, always watching, listening, learning, and giving you smart alerts as updates. And this is, every, I'll jump in here. Um, this is something that everybody's familiar with when it comes down to it, right? I, I don't know how many people, I've got Alexa all over my house. Uh, some people have, oh, she just blinked. <laughs> uh, and, <laughs> I unplugged and, her. 
Yeah, yeah, exactly. Somebody's got Google or computer or, you know, there are any number of different things um, and they connect in so many different dynamic ways. And it, I mean, you know, for me, I yell at Alexa and I, I say, hey, add this to my shopping list or, hey, I want to listen to my auto, audible book while I'm, while I'm on the computer. Um, and we started to really dynamically connect these things. The same um, um, hasn't been true in the restaurant industry, but I think can be really beneficial. And you think about, you know, if you have uh, a computer system up and it's, uh, uh, we have uh, uh, in bait testing, we look at things like um, what are, what are support type pieces that, that Mabel could, or an AI could, um, could help with in a, in a setting, right? And you could put an Alexa hockey puck in a, in a, um, sorry, let's try again. Uh, you can put an Alexa hockey puck in a, in a kitchen um, so that it can talk to people. You can do things like, um, you know, on our side, on the Mabel side, you can literally uh, get a phone call. Someone wants to have a banquet, right? And your manager's taking and saying, okay, I've got a, I've got a, a, a hundred person event on the 14th and it's gonna be out on the patio and they want heavy apps and they want, you know, these different X, Y, Z, here are all the different parameters. And, you know, Mabel on our side um, is integrated through Alexa Pike Plus. So she can literally pick that up and say, hey, do you want to create an event in your event calendar? And then what's the next step? What's the next process? How does that all interconnect? And so we started thinking, well, if we can get all these different programs to work together, scheduling events, all this different piece, we can really help supplement and, and save managers time. And so, you know, on our side, you can, you can say that to, to Mabel um, and then uh, she'll plug it into your event calendar. So it's on there. And then she'll plug it into your schedule and say that typically when you've had and historically the last 1500 person events, you've scheduled three extra servers, an extra bartender and two extra kitchen people or whatever that happens to be, right? And she will go ahead and say, based on that, I'm going to, on this date, suggest these extra people in your schedule. So when I send you your schedule template, right, for your managers to approve, you're staffed up and geared up and ready to rock. And you don't need a manager to spend two to three hours calling around and finding people in those things, especially when you have Mabel who has, who's integrated with your scheduling app and your event calendar and these other different things. So, you know, that speech processing piece right, is just as important as video processing, which is this next step with Dave. Video processing is, is another thing. I mean, customer sentiment, we're talking about uh, the dynamics of, um, of observant, observed behavior um, and pattern recognition. Um, so things like, can you tell uh, if uh, table 14, right, is all looking around and they've got a credit card in their hand and they're trying to figure out what's going on, and their server had just dropped something and then left. And maybe their server's dealing has tables in another area of the restaurant. Or maybe the server's in the back talking to the kitchen. Or maybe the server's just in the bathroom, right? But I, I don't know how many times I certainly have personally experienced this. I'm sure you all have. Um, where you're in a restaurant and you're, you got to rush out the door for a movie or for whatever reason. And right at the end, your server ghosts you. And you're like, gosh, I wish I had them. Well, can we train a camera? Can we train an AI? to observe behavior where people are turning their heads and looking around. And then if we can train them to do those things, can we pick up and they can start to make inferences, right? And so then the next step is once they make an inference, can they then send that inference as an alert to someone? So for example, if your server's in the back, can Mabel say, ooh, server's in the back, people looking around, they've got credit card up, they're looking for a check, obviously they want to call it the bill. I'm going to send a smart alert. I'm going to ping my manager on duty and say, hey, table 14 is looking to close out, please investigate. So the manager can then go over and say, oh, hey, uh, I just saw you guys looking around, are you looking for something? And then they don't have the three or four minutes waiting for the server that can feel like 15 minutes at the end of a meal, right? And so you deal with these problems in the moment as opposed to the next day on, you know, uh, on Twitter or on Facebook or on Yelp or on any one of these reviews. And I think uh, in general, it's that immediacy that's important. It's that immediacy that's lacking. And that's really where an AI can truly help is, in, is those in the moment interventional needs. Um, and I mean, that's, those are minor examples. Theft deterrence, right? Things like if you've got a camera on and Jenny is over at a, a computer 
and she's or at a point of sale and she's plugging in a bunch of things and then she voids something and she types in a manager's number, right? If you have a if you have a camera synced up with your point of sale and an AI filtering information from both sources, they can say, well, that's Jenny at the computer and she typed in X number, but she also typed in another one and that's John's number and John's not at that computer. And they can flag a manager and say, hey, John, the manager, your number was just used for a void over here by Jenny. And John can look and go, oh, well, yeah, I, you know, I, I'm in the middle of this thing. So I just told her, told her she can go do that, right? Or, uh, oh, I didn't give Jenny my number at all. I need to go figure out what's going on and why that's being used. Um, and that's stuff that you're not going to catch if you don't have that overlay. And you're not going to catch if you don't have an AI, because no one's got... 12 hours of time to review camera documents to potentially find uh, something, right? And the likelihood that that would go on for a long period of time without an AI overseeing that is extreme. I mean, I don't know if you're, if you, I, I certainly have had that happen in my restaurant where someone's, we've had theft issues and different things that have happened and we don't realize it for months until we can pour into data, then go review back and then go do these things. If you can have something that nips it in the bud and at the moment of, that's really where you get dynamic results, right? It's not about looking at dashboards. It's not about insights. It's about interventionality and how you can change an operation in the immediate need. Now, that's, that's the immediate stuff. The next stuff and the really interesting kind of next phase of this, and you see it all over the place, is customer sentiment. And if you've heard that, um, uh, the, the term is it's picking up really candid data. And that's the big piece is that candid data thing. So Dave, go to the, go to the next one. So pattern recognition um, and facial recognition and candid data is what we're talking about here. And actually, Dave, I'm going to have you stop sharing because I have to jump on. Yep. I need to share to show what we're, what, we're, what we're kind of working on. And what we're working on is if, if you have uh, an AI that can figure out how people are actually reacting to things, right? If you can deal with those things in the moment, it can give you all sorts of insights, insights we don't even think about now. And, you know, the example is we're all sitting at a meal. We're enjoying ourselves. I order a, a burger and I take a bite and it's not great, right? Now, am I likely to say anything to my server? Well, probably not, right? And, and certainly not if I'm a regular customer. As long as it's not like cold, or like wildly undercooked or any of those things. If it's just not that good, I'm gonna eat it and, and go about my day. Now, the same is true as if it's very good. The server will come over and she or he will say, oh, how was your burger? Oh, it's fine, thanks, everything's great. And they go off on their day. And they don't get the actual candid reaction. They don't get the actual, like how are you actually feeling about this thing? However, the people at my table probably did. Cause when I took my bite, I went, mm you know, or I went, oh my God, this is so good. And those reactions are dynamic and important and can give you insights into all sorts of different things. Man, the special that we've got, we've got 20 really positive reactions tonight. Let's look at running it again. And maybe this becomes a seasonal item. Um, we can look at kicking this number in. There are lots of different ways to, to sort of pull, and that's single example stuff, to pull all sorts of really dynamic data out of it. But the key is you have to be able to start reading faces. You have to be able to read, read customer sentiment, those different things. So I'm going to do a quick demo. Usually we'd do this and we'd have a big dashboard setting and 10 people on it. And I'd have a couple of people do different things. But for now, you're just going to have to stare at Dave in my face. And so what I'm going to do here, Dave, give me a smile. And I'll tell you when. Okay, Dave, big smile. Lori, can you give me a big smile? And then I'm going to be angry. Okay, all right, so I'm now going to uh, share my screen. Sorry, we're gonna be a little meta here. Okay, then I'm gonna go into my recognition. I'm going to upload. Yeah, screenshot. Oh, no, that's not the screenshot. That screenshot. <laughs> And I'm gonna upload this screenshot and we're gonna look at what we've got. 
Okay. And so oops, we gotta move this kind of out of the way. We've got this, got our screenshots here. We got there we go. We got Dave, uh, looks to be a face, appears to be a male, age range, uh, not smiling, appears to be calm, not wearing glasses. And there are a lot more insights you can pull out of out of here. We continue, right? And we go on to the next person. There we go. Okay. Ooh, 23 to 35. I love that. That's great. <laughs> Um, but 99% I'm not smiling, appears to be sad, not wearing glasses. Again, all these different, Lori, there you go. Smiling and happy, appears to be happy. Um, My age range is a little higher than yours. And I don't appreciate that. I feel, I feel, you know, we've got a bug. Evidently we've got to work out this bug. Yes. I'll talk to, I'll talk to Deb off. We'll get into it. I promise. Figure that out. <laughs> exactly. Uh, but so what I'm, what I'm trying to illustrate here is, as we develop these, and, and the AI learns. So as it gets more data sets and more understanding, it, it starts putting people into sentiment categories, right? And understanding how that sentiment works. And so for us, what we're looking at is how can you then use that data to interact on an operational level? Like what can happen? And you don't need full video and, and you don't even keep these images. And that's what the other thing, people say, oh, well, you know, what about privacy laws? What about those issues? We don't keep the issue. We don't keep the images at all. We don't store them. They don't go in the cloud or do any of those things. What we're looking at is the sentiment metadata, right? And so if you can get that sentiment metadata and then correlate that with other data streams that are coming in, you don't need to say, I don't need to know that individually I am unhappy about my burger and Lori is happy about her chicken, right? What you need to know is, is the trends and those big pieces because you can use those trends to change operations. Now, it's nice to have that sentiment data in the moment to send people over the table and do some of those other things to engage positively, right? But when it comes down to it, what you're really looking at is the ability to start defining data in broad spectrum and then refining that, being able to get insights and then being able to change that into that interventional, that operational immediacy, those, those, those real-time solutions. And that's where stuff like this really gets dynamic is, is how you start to engage with a customer um, uh, because of that and what that operational shift looks like. Um, so here, I'll come on. I'm gonna not share now. Uh, I'll say I'm not gonna, not, I'm not gonna not share. not coming up on my computer. Hold on. There we go. Oh, thank you. Um, so realistically, uh, the facial recognition, pattern recognition, all of these pieces, um, when it comes down to it, this is where the really dynamic kind of next level stuff is. Lots of people say, oh, we have insights and we have an AI that looks at this and does these things. But as you can kind of put all these, all these, um, uh, correlative data sets together. That's where, in, in my view, the next five to 10 years of um, artificial intelligence and how it'll integrate in the restaurant business um, will certainly start to, to, to trend. Um, and there are lots of people out there who are talking about all sorts of di different things, but from an effectiveness standpoint, being able to pull these data sources in, make them talk to each other, and then come up with uh, a plan of action um, using them is going to be at the absolute core of, of what a, a restaurant user needs to be able to navigate this wildly difficult restaurant world post pandemic. Um, so with that, you know, uh, that's kind of the, the, the brunt of our presentation. Um, we've got, when this gets shared out, there's some salesy stuff on the, on the back end. And if anyone's ever interested in talking to us about our product and how we're solving some of these problems I presented, we'd love to, to talk to you. Uh, uh, again, our goal uh, generally as a company is not to create more dashboards or insights or give you more work, or create more time for your staff. Um, it's to uh, come up with real hands-off solutions and save you time right save you a lot of time frankly have an assistant you know mabel rai we call it, she's the first virtual restaurant assistant as far as i know in the world um and she acts like a manager who's everywhere that's what she does she supports your staff she supports you she engages at a very um at a, at a, at a, in a very hands-on way 
be perfectly honest. So um, thanks everyone for your time. We really, we really appreciate it. And, um, and thanks for the day. And I know this will all get sent out to everybody. Um, so with that, I'll thank Orla and Lori and, um, um, and the team over there. Obviously, they've been wonderful, wonderful to us um, for the time and the chance to present. Sam, thank you and Dave as well uh, for doing this today. I, really interesting stuff. I, you know, I, I do hope uh, more people kind of can check this out. Um, it's a little bit over my head sometimes, but you know, you did a nice job of, uh, you know, explaining, uh, you know, really how this can be a, a great solution for managers who are just, you know, don't have the, you know, as much time as as uh, as they need to manage all staff. So. Yeah. Thank you again. And yes, as I mentioned, uh, all registrants uh, will be getting an uh, email from us this afternoon um, with the recording and the presentation. So perfect. Thank you, thank you both. Thank you. Thank you. Have a great day, everyone.